Well, we began a study of the book of Genesis last time, and if you've got your Bible, you can make your way to the book of Genesis. It's the very first book of the Bible, so you can just flip to the beginning of your Bible, and we'll still be in Genesis chapter 1 today. But I gave a brief overview of the book of Genesis last time. We then talked a bit about the Bible and science, since this is an issue which comes up when looking at the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. We talked about the limits of the Bible and the limits of science. The Bible is primarily God's message to the human race. It's not a science textbook. It's not good Bible scholarship to try to find hidden references to modern science in the Bible text. The book of Genesis was written some 3,500 years ago, and I can assure you that issues raised by modern scientific theories about the origin of the universe were not on the mind of Moses when he wrote the book of Genesis. He just wasn't thinking about that then. Guarantee you, he was not doing that. Science, on the other hand, studies the physical universe, what is observable and repeatable. It doesn't study the metaphysical realm. It can't make moral judgments about things. So to claim that the physical universe is, quote, all there is or ever was or will be, as Carl Sagan once proclaimed so famously, is absolute arrogance and a misrepresentation of real science. That kind of assertion is as much a religious commitment as Christianity is. There are many legitimate, respected scientists who believe in the supernatural and the God of the Bible. These people have found intellectually satisfying answers to the apparent contradictions between the Bible and science, and you too can also find legitimate, satisfying answers to those questions and issues. It's important that we remember who wrote the book of Genesis, who he originally wrote the book for, and why he originally wrote the book. Moses originally wrote the book to the Israelite people for the Israelite people. The descendants of Abraham, who had just recently been rescued from hundreds of years of slavery under the Egyptians, and were preparing to enter the promised land of Canaan. The Lord then led Moses to write the book to introduce these people to the Lord who has just rescued them from Egypt, and to teach them who they are, where they come from, and why the Lord God has taken special interest in them as a people. Only after we have gotten a grasp of these things are we able to make accurate responsible interpretation and application of the text for our own lives in the times that we're living in. Well, then we looked at the first verse of the book of Genesis. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is a declaration that God is the originator of all of time and space and matter. All that we see and know about was brought into existence by God. Finally, we considered the question, why did God create? And we talked about three reasons he created. He created to display his glory. We certainly see his glory, his majesty, his creativity, his power on display in what has been made. He created to show his goodness. Everything God made was good. We'll read in Genesis 1, after each period of creative effort, it says God saw that it was good. Finally, he created to share his love. God made us to know him and to share his love with us. Well, let's take a look at Genesis 1, verse 2. It says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the first verse is this grand declaration that God created the universe. This second verse describes the condition of the earth as the Lord begins to prepare it as a home for humanity. We have an earth described here as without form, a waste, desolate, void, empty, lifeless, and darkness, no light, chaos. Into this situation of formless, lifeless chaos, we have the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. 
This word translated <coughs> hovering over is actually a figure of speech which is used to describe the hovering or the fluttering of a mother bird over her chicks. We find the same word being used in Deuteronomy 32.11 when God is likened to a mother eagle fluttering or hovering over her brood. She spreads her wings over her children. It conveys this intimate care. And a similar idea is being conveyed to us. God the Spirit is intimately involved in the creation. He comes hovering over our world, spreading his wings of love and provision, bringing order from chaos, life from emptiness, beauty from desolation. The Lord does the same good work in our individual lives too, doesn't he? As we come into a relationship with him through Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God brings order from the chaos in us. He brings life from the emptiness, and he brings beauty from the desolation. Well, before moving on to the next verses, which describe the six days of creation, I would like to pause here once again and discuss some of the theories and explanations that have been offered to reconcile the Genesis 1 account of creation with modern science. I know this is a, an issue. It's a, one of those elephants in the room, and we should talk about it. The situation is this. Based on current scientific observations, calculations, and theorizing, the age of the universe is estimated to be about 13.8 billion years. And life on earth is believed to have first appeared about three and a half billion years ago. So the big question is how is this reconciled with the creation account that we have here in Genesis 1, which describes a fully formed, full of life, planet earth, and all of the various objects in space coming into being in six days? That's a pretty good question. The first thing to realize is that our understanding of the universe continues to progress as our ability to observe it improves. This is the nature of good science. We modify our physics formulas and our theories to more accurately represent what we observe in the universe. For example, Newtonian physics, utilizing Newton's laws of motion, had been relied upon for understanding how things work in our universe for several hundred years. Isaac Newton first published his works in 1687. The formula from Newtonian physics that you might be familiar with is F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. You're like, oh yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> the basic formula, <coughs> excuse me, the basic formulas for Newtonian physics are still used today in many applications of everyday life. However, Newtonian physics don't give accurate results when you're dealing with things that are very small, subatomic particles, for example, things that are traveling very fast, the speed of light, for example, and things with very large gravitational force, black holes, for example. As a result, theories such as general relativity and quantum mechanics have been developed, which provide better explanations for these things. So as our abilities to measure and observe the universe improve further, we will develop yet more things, theories, equations, that even better describe what we have. My point is this. Science is constantly moving forward improving, and rightly so. There's still a lot about the universe that we don't understand. Much of its workings are still shrouded in mystery. So everyone should maintain a good dose of humility and awe about these things. Now what I'm about to say may be very surprising for some of you to hear because you've taken hold of a particular interpretation of the Bible so firmly, but breathe deeply, take the hand of the person next to you. Here we go. The scientific theory of evolution is not necessarily an enemy of the Bible and Christianity. <gasps> oh my God. Did you really say that? Yeah, I just said that. So relax. 
See, the idea that more complex life forms have evolved from less complex forms through the process of natural selection is a theory that attempts to explain what has been observed and can be observed in our world. This theory is not irreconcilable with the Bible. A person can be a Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christian and accept that God uses the process of natural selection to create the living things that fill our planet. What is incompatible with the Bible and the Christian faith is philosophical naturalism, philosophical evolution, which removes the existence of God and his involvement in the creation process and instead makes the general ideas of the theory of of, of the theory of evolution without God, the all-encompassing explanation for the existence of everything. Our non-negotiables as believers in Jesus Christ, in very simple terms, are these. God exists. God created. God entered our world in the person of Jesus Christ to reconcile us to himself. Remember the lesson of Galileo and the church, which we talked about last time. The church took hold of the current view of the day that the earth was the center of the solar system. They took that theory and they made it biblical. They said, that's what the Bible teaches. And then when a newer, more accurate view of the solar system came to light, namely that the sun is the center of the solar system. Well, the church fought against that, believing it to be contradictory with the Bible, and they branded Galileo a heretic. In reality, the Bible makes no direct statements about the technical structure of the solar system. Don't make the Bible say more or less than it really says in an attempt to defend or protect it. It's the word of God. It will continue to stand throughout time. We need to make sure that we don't turn this living, dynamic text into a static dead thing through our own misguided good intentions to stand up for God. To put it another way, be wise about the hills you choose to die on. Now, with all of that being said, let's talk a moment about a few of the many explanations, the many explanations that have been proposed by Christians for reconciling Genesis 1 with current scientific theory. Remember, these are all just theories, and all of them have their strengths and their weaknesses. They all have problems. They all you know, sound really good when you first read it, and then you read the next guy, and then you're convinced that he's got a better idea, and then you read the next guy, and then you're convinced that he's got the best idea. I generally favor whichever one I read the most recent. I want to say that holding to one of these theories over another does not make you a better or worse Christian than someone else. Cling to the non-negotiables and leave the rest of this for friendly banter around the water cooler. The gap theory. I mentioned this theory first because it's between verses one and two of Genesis chapter one that some speculate that a huge unknown period of time exists. In other words, between these two verses is where they stuff the many billions of years that are not directly accounted for in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Lots of stuff happens. Then the earth was without form and void. That's how they see this. Supporters of this theory suggest that God created the heavens and the earth, verse 1, and then some catastrophic event took place that destroyed the earth, leaving it without form and void, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and onward then describes a recreating of the earth following this catastrophic event, making it suitable for humanity. Many of the supporters of this theory believe that the catastrophic event which destroyed the earth was Satan being cast out of heaven and down onto the earth. 
The day-age theory. There are a number of variations, but the basic idea is this, that the days of Genesis chapter 1 are not literal 24-hour days, but ages or epochs or eons of time of indeterminate length. The days of Genesis 1 are then taken and correlated with the geological timetable of modern science. The literal view. Genesis 1 is understood and interpreted in a very literal way and simply allowed to appear to be in conflict with modern scientific ideas about the origin of the universe. A day in Genesis 1 is a 24-hour day, and God made the whole universe in six 24-hour days. The appearance of these long geologic time periods that we observe are explained as simply being a part of the creation by God. He, he made it all that way. In other words, God created an adult universe ready for humanity to inhabit. The logic goes something like this. You have to start somewhere when you decide to make a universe. So you may as well begin with a full-blown, fully functioning one rather than start with a blob of energy in empty space and then guide it into its present form over the course of 13.8 billion years. Under this theory, the age-old question is finally answered about the chicken and the egg. The chicken came first. God made the first chicken, an adult chicken, which then laid eggs to make all the future chickens. See, God didn't need time to create the universe. Time is as much part of God's creation as space and matter are. So the length of time needed to create the universe is not a limiting factor for God. A billion years to him is the same as one second since he out, exists outside of time. Creating outside of time would give God the freedom too to create out of sequence. He could make a tree, for example, before he made the soil and the water for the tree to live in if he wanted to. This idea is analogous to a person writing a novel. The typical novel drops you into the middle of a story taking place in a fully formed world. When writing a novel, there's nothing to prevent the author from writing various chapters out of sequence. The author might write the very last chapter of the book before the first chapter of the book. When writing a novel, the author may spend more author time on chapter five than he spends author time on chapter eight. The author's time is completely different and independent of the novel's time. As a result, it would be impossible for the characters in the novel to know how long it took for the author to create their story. How might the author go about trying to explain the creating process that he went through to bring his characters into being in a way that his characters would understand? Could Genesis 1 be that? Now, the amazing thing about our story is this. The author entered his own story to communicate with us, to have a relationship with us, and to rescue us from a very bad plot twist that we introduced into the story. The literary view. The Genesis creation story is a literary or poetic description rather than a literal technical description. The description is figurative, told from the perspective of a person living some 3,500 years ago and confronts a dominant culture which was polytheistic, namely the Egyptian culture. This doesn't mean that the description we have in Genesis 1 is untrue. It means that it's represent. It's representational or figurative, communicating essential truths about God and how the universe came into being, which were relevant for the people of that time. Here's a little illustration to maybe help explain this. I might describe a home run in baseball by saying, the batter ripped a stick through the air, launching a bomb, and then took a round trip. Now, that description is not a technical description of a home run, but it does represent what happened. And can you imagine the confusion that 
a description like that might cause for someone reading it 3,500 years into the future. There's no direct mention of a baseball or a bat or the running of bases or the ball going over the home run fence. None of that was mentioned in my description. Are we faced with a similar situation in Genesis 1 where we're looking at a one-page description of creation from 3,500 years ago, is it reasonable to take this highly idealized, highly condensed description from ancient history and then lay it alongside the latest scientific theories and criticize it for not being an accurate account? What might be seen in our day as grossly outdated and simple as an account of the origin of the universe was for the people of Moses' day very contemporary, compelling, groundbreaking, and worldview changing. One Bible commentator writes, a literary reading of Genesis 1 still permits the retention of day as a solar day of 24 hours, but it understands day not as a chronological account of how many hours God invested in his creating project, but as an analogy of God's creative activity. God reveals himself to his people in a medium with which they can identify and which they can comprehend. The creation account portrays a God who speaks, who evaluates, who deliberates, who forms, who animates, who regulates. The intended audience of Genesis 1 will fully identify with that model. The creation account also portrays a God who created on six days and rested on the seventh. The audience, accustomed to their own work week, will, will identify with that model too, i.e. their Sabbath rest. Finally, related to all of this is the field of scientific inquiry being done by scientists, philosophers, and other scholars identifying evidence of intelligent design in the very structure of the universe. This is an effort, really, to debunk the philosophical theory of evolution, which is driven entirely by random chance. The complexity of the DNA molecule is one example of many of intelligent design. This special molecule contains the information an organism needs to develop, live, and reproduce. It contains the instructions for how to construct every component of a particular life form. The human genome, for example, contains approximately 3 billion base pairs, which reside in the 23 chromosomes, pairs of chromosomes in the nucleus of our cell. Where did that complex, sophisticated information come from? Did it come into being by random chance over several billion years? Or did it come from an intelligent creator from outside of our system? There are a number of other ideas for how to reconcile Genesis chapter 1 and, and further with current scientific theory. And I've only briefly touched on the ones mentioned here. There are lots of books and other resources that you can access if you want to know more about these things. There was even a small group here at the church this last fall that was studying some of these ideas and theories. Suffice it to say that there are reasonable answers available for you. You don't have to fear science, and you don't have to be a simpleton to believe in the Bible. At the same time, you don't have to embrace any of these theories to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. Finally, Christian, our first concern should be to represent Jesus well and lead people to him. That should be our primary concern. Saying things like, evolution is stupid, doesn't help that cause. <laughs> the final answer, I said it last week, Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. 
In the end, we come to the issue of faith in every case. Does God exist? Did God create? We each must choose between believing in a mindless set of lucky chances or in an all-powerful creative being. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. We'll pick up in verse 3 and take a look at day 1 of the creation description here. It says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, and there was morning the first day. So the first thing that God creates is light. The specifics of what this included is not specified here. Did it include the actual physical light producing things that are in our universe, like the stars and our sun? Or is this to be understood as a description of God himself infusing the creation with his light, his energy, his power, his truth, his glory? Light is representative in the Bible of the truth and the presence and the glory of God. When he says, let there be light, he is certainly infusing the creation with his glory and his truth and his presence. We're told in 1 Timothy 6.16 that God dwells in unapproachable light. <clears throat> the appearance of the stars, the sun, and the moon doesn't take place until day four. Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 19. Now, they may have been created on day one, but weren't visible to someone on earth until day four. We don't know. But this serves to illustrate the kind of puzzles that we're faced with when we try to superimpose onto the Genesis description a modern scientific understanding of how the universe came into being. See, if we're trying to follow the literal sequence that we would expect based on scientific observations with the way things work right now, then the question is raised, how can light exist without light producing objects like the sun and the other stars? <clears throat> Excuse me. If, on the other hand, we see the Genesis account as a rebuttal to the dominant world view that the Israelites have just been delivered from, the Egyptians, then the mechanical sequence is not of primary importance, but rather the symbolic sequence. The Egyptians worshipped the sun, the moon, the constellations, and a lot of other things. Some sources say that the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, had over 2,000 different gods that they worshipped. The sun god, Ra, was their most important god. Here, in Genesis 1, the first beat of creation, the Israelites, who have just been delivered from Hundreds of years of slavery under the Egyptians are told that the one true God, the Lord, created the light. And he created the light before the sun even existed, Egypt's most important God. All of the gods of the Egyptians, even their very important God, Ra, are not gods at all. They are things that God created. We'll see further when we get to day four that the sun... Egypt's big God was created to serve God's people, not to be served by them as a God. You see how different the perspective can be when we look at this from the perspective of Moses and the people that he originally wrote this description to? It's very different. I'd like to close this morning <clears throat> by reading a portion of a creation poem found in the book of Psalms, Psalm 104. And I want you to note that this is not a technical description of how God created. Instead, it's a beautiful tribute to God as the creator. And I think we should see Genesis 1 in a similar kind of light of primary importance. 
It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You're clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He set the world on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they might not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted in them the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows its time for setting. You make darkness and it is night when all the beasts of the field creep about. The young lions roar for their Pray, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Father God, we thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have created all of this. You've created stuff that we don't even know is there yet. The mystery of the universe is profound. It displays your glory, your majesty, your creativity, your wisdom. We worship you, Father. I pray that you would encourage each person here this morning. Remind us, Father, of our place before you. Insignificant, but oh, so precious. <clears throat> you have made a good home for us here. I ask that you would bless us with a fresh realization of your goodness today, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>